Well, good morning. Good morning. We have an audience this morning. <laughs> oh my goodness. What a blessing to be in the midst of nature and uh, be able to see the sunshine and some of the warmth in this uh, Southern California Sunday morning. Uh, I don't know how hot, how hot it is already at 930, but uh, it's getting up there close to 100. 89 right now? All right. Well, that's good. That's good. This morning we're going to be in Colossians chapter 2. And uh, we're going to be talking about some uh, pretty spiritual things. The first two chapters of Colossians are basically theological. There's Paul's foundation for the things he's going to teach us in the, in the last two chapters. And uh, the last couple of weeks we've been in chapter 1. We've been looking at how Paul prayed for the Christians in the city of Colossae and uh, this amazing prayer that they would grow in wisdom and knowledge, that they would have confidence about their understanding of God's will, that they would be connected to God in ways that would allow them to grow and to prosper. And I just love that. And then the second part of that chapter, he talked about the supremacy of Jesus Christ and how Jesus was in control of everything. And uh, I, th that was just so exciting. I enjoyed that message last week. This week, chapter 2, Paul is uh, pulling back a little bit. He's attacking some things that are challenging the church in, in Colossae, and, um, and yet he's not attacking specific things because he probably understands that there's more things out there in the world that we need to be aware of as Christians and uh, there's only one thing that's important. And so this morning in Colossians chapter 2, I just have one point. Jesus is the most important thing in the whole universe. And if we are connected to Jesus, then we have everything we need. If we're not connected to Jesus, then we have nothing that we need. And Paul takes that principle or that idea and builds a theological foundation for that idea in chapter 2. Now... I grew up in New England, and so I was uh, in contact with people that went to all different kinds of churches. And I'm not going to name the churches because there's too many of them to name. And, and some of them you wouldn't know and wouldn't be interested in. Some of them would, uh, you probably would know, and you might, you might be convicted about things. But I remember as a young man coming to know Christ as my Savior and then realizing that some of the churches in my town did not worship the Lord Jesus Christ. They had a religion with a list of rules and regulations. They had a, a religious philosophy with some intellectual secrets that helped them to organize their life and, and make sense out of their life. They had a variety of different things that had nothing to do with Jesus that helped them to focus their mind and their heart on their goals and their objectives. I was watching television a few years ago and. One of the famous uh, talk show hosts uh, came on and talked about how spiritual she was. And I knew from watching her show that she wasn't a Christian. And yet she was talking about being spiritual. And that really challenged me. Like, what in the world? Like, how can she claim to be spiritual? She's not a Christian. And she talks about not being a Christian. And what does that mean? And I discovered that there is a kind of a worldly spirituality that looks like a religious expression, but it isn't. It's just a way to manage your life and a, and a kind of a philosophy that gives you meaning and purpose in the things that you do. And I was challenged by that. And this passage actually talks about that twice. The idea of worldly spirits that govern our lives and that influence our decisions but they are not part of what God wants us to be allowing to drive our life. And so one of the things we're going to have to do today is we're going to have to ask some questions or maybe answer some questions. What are the philosophies? What are the ideas? What are the influences on my life that don't represent who Jesus is? Because we're going to see as we read through the chapter that knowing Jesus is the source of all of our wisdom, our knowledge, Jesus helps us answer the questions of life. Jesus helps us connect with God. And Jesus helps us to, to understand how to live a meaningful, godly life. And these other things that surround us will not do that. Let's jump in to Colossians chapter 2, verse 1. 
For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea, and for, who, and for all who have seen me face to face, that their hearts, no, for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is in Christ. So Paul wants the people that haven't met him yet to be reassured, to have assurance that even though they haven't met Paul, because they have met Jesus, they have everything that they need. And so I think the beginning of this chapter, Paul is intentionally doing this little thing where he communicates to these people that he hasn't met that you don't have to meet me. It's not about me. It's not about my sermons. It's not about the things I preach. It's about Jesus who is the object of, of my faith, and he is the foundation of your faith. And I love that because today here at Stone Creek Bible Church, none of us have met the Apostle Paul. None of us have had the privilege to meet any of the apostles that, that lived with Jesus and, and witnessed how Jesus lived. But we have the Word of God, we have the Spirit of God in our lives, and we have the ability to understand who Jesus is and how he wants us to live our lives. And I think that should give us huge assurance about the decisions we make and the purposes that we choose. Now let's look at uh, some more of this. God's mystery which is in Christ. Verse 3, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And that's a that's a broad, pretty broad statement. Um, some of you may be math people. Some of you may be biology people. Some of you may be uh, sociology people. Some of you may be Facebook people. Some of you may have understanding and insight about things that influence your life. And those understandings and insights give you a sense of power and being able to control your life. But Paul is taking the opportunity here to tell us, is there something that we need to know? Is there something that we need to be uh, able to exercise wisdom in, those things come from Christ. All those things that we need are hidden in Christ. Then verse 4, Paul says, I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. And so here he's affirming the, the Colossian church based on what he's heard from people who have been there. But his main point is that the wisdom that we need for life and the knowledge that we need for life comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. That he is the revelation of God and God's purpose and God's will in our lives. Verse 6. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. In other words, if you want to know how to live your life, Walk in Christ, follow his example, obey his teaching, do the things that he tells us to do in the word of God. Now, when I was in college, I, I met some people who were into transcendental meditation. And that was a, a, an amazing, powerful trend back when I was a youngster. It was this idea that you could literally meditate yourself to a higher spiritual plane, that you could connect with the divine universe that you could experience being part of the universe in this meditation process. But as I shared and asked questions about their story and their experience, some of the people who were Christians who had been involved in that movement would talk about things that were absolutely unbelievable. Their experience with little spirits that would sit on their shoulder and talk to them, familiar spirits different experiences that they would have in their meditation process. And I began to understand that even from their perspective as people who had been part of this process of becoming more godlike, there was a variety of different things that I could understand from my Bible were not part of God's plan for Christians. Like, oh my goodness, you guys shouldn't be doing this because it's not gonna bring you where you need to be, where you need to go. And I think Paul is addressing that here in this, in this chapter. He's telling the Colossians, hey guys, 
The things that people who are talking to you about, you don't need to worry about those things. Don't be distracted by those things. Don't be discouraged by those things because in Christ you have everything that you need. Now, who were the people in the Colossian church? Well, they were Gentiles mostly who had probably come to know Christ as a result of going down to Ephesus, about 120 miles uh, down from Colossae towards the coast of Asia Minor on the western side of what is now Turkey. Uh, they could have gone down that journey and they would have traveled down the Lycus River Valley with their goods and services and things they were gonna sell in the market at Ephesus. And uh, while they were in Ephesus, while Paul was there, some of those people may have heard Paul preach. Some of those people may have had friends that went down and heard Paul preach and then they came back and told what Paul was teaching. And so there was an awareness of who God is from that church in Ephesus. So the Colossians were loosely connected to the church in Ephesus, but they were about 120 miles away, up in the, the beginning of a river valley that was just absolutely beautiful. The city of Colossae was on one side of that valley and it was known for the, the cool uh, rain and snow melt waters that would come off of the mountain that was up above them and it would run down through their town these cool mountain streams. Then in the middle of the valley was this city that, that Paul has mentioned, the city of Laodicea. And Laodicea was at the center of the valley. It was at a crossroads. It was the largest commercial city in that valley in that day. And uh, then on the other side of the valley, there was a city called Hierapolis. And Hierapolis had some hot springs. And uh, there was some volcanic activity there. and. There are a series of hot springs, and some of them are about 140 degrees hot. And some of them, they trickle down the mountain and form other pools and springs, get down to about 70. So all the way from 70 to 140, and you could kind of pick how hot you wanted to sit in the springs. And these springs had kind of healing power, and people from all over the Roman Empire would come to the city of Hierapolis to, to go in the hot tub or the, the spa pools and uh, they would get healed from some of their rashes and skin diseases, and so it was kind of a healing thing. And there were a lot of people there that were practicing medicine and helping people deal with their stuff. And so these three cities are part of the same valley, kind of like Murrieta and Temecula and Wildemar. Colossae and, and Laodicea are about eight miles apart. Colossae and Hierapolis are about 12 miles apart. So very similar, Temecula, Murrieta, Wildemar. Now, one of the things about these three cities that I wanna just remind you of is that in the book of Revelation, there are specific letters to seven churches. And we're not sure if these churches represent um, just different things that churches get caught up in, or if they represent historical periods of the church. There's different views about that. But the last church that has a letter in, in Revelation chapter 3 is the, the letter to the church at Laodicea. And so I wanted you to know that, that Laodicea is right next to Corinth, or, uh, Colossae, the city of Colossae. And it's only about eight miles apart. Now, Colossae was known for its cold water, and Hierapolis was known for its hot water. And the letter of Re in Revelation chapter 3 to the Laodicean church is written to them. And, and, and John says in that letter, he says, I'm writing to you and I'm, I'm pointing out that you have, you have been flirting with things you shouldn't be flirting with. And you're going to face judgment because you are neither hot nor cold. You are lukewarm. <laughs> and I'm going to spit you out of my mouth is what God says. And I think it's just interesting that as we read through the book of Colossians, we're reading the book that was written to the church that was in a smaller town, but, but an effective church. And the church right next door to them, Laodicea, was a church that became known for their lukewarmness, for the fact that they weren't positive or negative. They were just kind of lukewarm. And Laodicea was a very... A wealthy church. It was a wealthy city. It was very prosperous and had a lot of things going on. And it made life for the Christians very difficult. 
Now in Colossae, they were a little bit removed from this. And I'm not sure why Paul writes his letter to the Colossian church instead of the Laodicean church. As we finish the book of Colossians, we'll discover that Paul did write a letter to the Laodicean church, but we don't know exactly what that letter is. We'll find out about that in a couple weeks. So the Colossian church was a church that Paul desperately cared about. It was a smaller church in a smaller city. They weren't as prosperous, but they were known for their fresh water and their healthy food and their ability to make a living. And so Paul is writing to them about how to keep their lives on track. Verse 6, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. So here in this verse, you've got these three instructions. How should you be related to Christ? Well, you should be rooted in him. You should draw your ideas, your energy, your enthusiasm for being related to God from your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You should be grounded in him. Don't let anybody remove you from your relationship with Christ. And then that last phrase, um, thanksgiving, abounding in thanksgiving. And again, this, this word is used several times in the book of Colossians to describe the Christian church. It was a church that gave thanks for what God was doing in their lives and in the circumstances that they faced. Verse 8, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. And so here, Paul gives us a list of different influences that was prevalent in the Colossian church. Now, we know from history that there was a Jewish community in Colossae. And so there were probably people who talked to the Christians there in Colossae about the Old Testament scriptures and about the Old Testament law and about the food regulations. And, and uh, it, it's, it's probable that some of those Jewish people thought that those Gentile Christians should live like Jews. And they probably had the argument there. Should we be circumcised or not circumcised? What, how should we reflect our faith in our community? And there was probably a lot of discussion about Jewish rules and regulations. We also know that there were Greek philosophers there who taught them about good and evil with no perspective about God. They taught them about what things were good and what things were evil and how you could philosophically argue through the answers to those questions. So how are you supposed to live your life? Well, our philosophy says that you should live your life this way, in a way that builds up the human race, in a way that builds up your family or your clan, in a way that has a different reasons, but the answers to the questions of these people were basically described by a human philosophy. And then Paul talks about elemental traditions and elemental spirits of the world. And so there were people there that I believe were teaching the Christians a kind of a worldly spirituality. Not a godly spirituality, but a worldly spirituality. And I'm not sure exactly what that means. But we have organizations and churches and religious expressions in America today that, that teach those same things. They teach us that we should have a positive attitude. And that if we set goals and we have positive attitude and dreams, that we will attract the fulfillment of those dreams. There was a movie a few years ago made in Australia called The Secret. And the book that was written following the movie sold millions of copies, made $65 million in its second uh, print. It was the biggest second printing of a book that had ever happened. And uh, this book, The Secret, was all about the law of attraction. And the idea that you could positively think yourself into a fortune, if that was your goal, if that was your dream. Or that if you would make the dream of people loving you, that you could, you could use positive feelings and thoughts to attract being loved. Isn't that cool? I think it's cool. But it doesn't have anything to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul is kind of saying in this chapter, hey folks, there's all kinds of things that are going to distract you from your relationship to Jesus. Don't be distracted. Don't be caught up in these things that are based on secrets or philosophies 
or movements or, or worldly spirituality because the answers to your problems and questions are not going to be found there. <clears throat> then, that very next verse, verse 9, he says, For in him, talking about Jesus, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And verse 10, And you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. Oh my goodness. So Paul brings this theological statement to bear right after he's talked about all the different kinds of things that influence our decisions and our, our goals and our objectives and, our, and, and the way we live our life. And what does he say? He says that in Jesus, the fullness of deity, which means everything about God, lives in Jesus bodily. Now, one of the things about Greek philosophy that the, the Christians in Colossae had to deal with was a Greek philosophy that basically said that the good in the world was abstract. It was spiritual. It wasn't physical. It was based on ideas and knowledge. It was not based on experiences and feelings. And so some of the Greek philosophies taught this idea that in the physical world, there was nothing good. That everything in the physical world was evil. And that the, the non-physical reality, the spiritual world, is the only place where there was good. And so they would take those principles, and based on those principles, they would have explanations and teachings about how Christians should live. And they would literally argue that you can't do anything good in the physical world. Which means helping somebody who needs money or who needs food or who needs clothes, that that physical expression isn't really good. It's just a part of the evil world and, and it doesn't do you any good. And so you don't have to deal with people like that. You don't have to meet their needs. You don't have to sacrifice in order to help them with their problems. You can just ignore those problems. And so some of these philosophies were actually a, a huge challenge to the way Christians were, were living their lives in this city. But I also want you to understand and to see that not only is Paul making a theological statement about who Jesus is, he's also making a theological statement about who we are. Look at that again. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him. Now, it's not the same thing, but I believe it's a similar thing. Paul is saying, hey... <laughs> Everything that needs to be known about God is in Jesus. And if you're in Jesus, you have access to the fullness of deity. So when we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are receiving everything that can be received about God. And that's what Paul is saying. He's reminding those believers in the city of Colossae that they have access to everything that God is. They don't need those philosophies. They don't, they don't need the special secrets. They don't need the special information. They don't need any of the things that these other religions are teaching them. They can relax in knowing that if they are in Christ, they have everything that they can get about God. And then he says, at the end of verse 10, In him who is the head of all rule and authority... In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So Paul uses this Jewish symbol, circumcision, which in Jewish times was just the removal of a little bit of flesh from, the, from their bodies. And, and Paul is saying, hey, <laughs> the circumcision that you get in Christ is not the removal of a little bit of flesh from your body. It's the removal of your whole flesh. When Jesus died on the cross, if you're in him, then your whole physical body dies. And so you don't have to worry about that anymore. Then in the next verse, he uses the picture of baptism, which was a, crypt, a Christian symbol and a Christian experience. And he explains a little bit about baptism. Verse 12, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. 
And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with Christ, having forgiven us all our trespasses. By canceling the record of death that stood against us with its legal arguments, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. And so Jesus does this strange thing where he helps us to understand the meaning of baptism. And that's something that we talk about every once in a while as we go through the Gospels. We, we talk about the fact that when a person is baptized, they come and they stand in the water like Jesus stood in the water. It's, they're identifying with Jesus. And then we talk about the fact that in baptism, they're, they're, they are um, communicating a picture or a testimony that in Christ, they are dead to sin and they're buried in the water, and then they're raised up to eternal life. And so baptism is a picture of what happens in the life of a believer when they come to know Christ. Their sin dies, and they are raised to newness of life. And Paul uses this illustration as a way for us to understand how we as Christians, when we are baptized in Christ, it's like God raised Jesus from the dead in resurrection, uh, the Easter message, and part of that Easter message is that we have also, in Christ, been raised to newness of life, without sin. And so as we live our lives and God looks at us from heaven, He doesn't see our sin. He sees only our obedience, only our glory, only the things that He will reward us for. And so He's giving the Colossians a picture of who they are in their relationship to God, by using these two terms, circumcision, the Jewish term. But his use of the term circumcision is not about taking off a little bit of our flesh. It's about us dying with Christ and having all of our flesh circumcised. It's like our spirit is separated from our body, and so we are able to live our lives in a way that's totally different. <clears throat> Verse 12, oh yeah, having been buried with him in baptism. And then uh, verse 13, the end of verse 13, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. By canceling the record of death that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. I love that phrase, nailing it to the cross. It's as if Jesus took the indictment against us, all the things that we have ever done that are that's wrong. Oh, yeah, there you go, Pastor Jay. He said a lie. You know, he was rude. He was unkind. He was, he was selfish. He was greedy. He was this. He was that. And it's like God took that list of all the things that I am guilty of, and he nailed it to the cross when Jesus was crucified. And so Paul is basically saying all of our sins were nailed to the cross with Jesus. There is nothing that we have to worry about being accountable for. Well... Once I say that, I realize that if that's true, then I don't have to worry about sin. And it's true. I don't have to worry about sin. But in my relationship with other people, my sins cause offense. They cause hurt. They cause wounded feelings. And so as a believer, one of the things I want to do is I want to make sure that I maintain and rebuild relationships that I have, that I have destroyed by my sin. 1 John 1, 9 tells me that if I confess my sin then I will experience the forgiveness that God promises in my life and that he will not only forgive me, but that he will cleanse me from sin. He will actually take my life and clean it up from the sins that I confess. Oh my goodness, what an amazing privilege. What a way for us to experience the work of God in our life. When we experience forgiveness, when we experience cleansing, when we see God working in our life in a way that sets us free from the sins that so easily ensnare us or trap us. And so I love that passage. And what is he doing? Paul is building a foundation for these Colossian Christians to trust their faith in Christ, to trust what God is going to do in their life because of their faith in Christ. But notice also that he is, um, in verse 15, he says that in that process, Jesus disarmed the rulers and the authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. Now, I think that part of what Jesus, that what part of what Paul is doing in this passage is he's building a theological foundation for the way Christians should live. 
And he's basically saying at the beginning of the chapter, hey, don't worry about philosophies. Don't worry about secrets. Don't worry about any of these crazy ideas that people tell you. Now he's talking about Jesus. And in this phrase, he's saying that Jesus triumphed over the rulers and the authorities. Who is he talking about? Well, I think in that day, they would have fought Jewish rulers. Well, how did Jesus triumph over? Well, he triumphed over the chief priests in Jerusalem. He triumphed over the, the Pharisees who taught the law uh, to the people of Israel. He triumphed over the, the, the Roman authorities who sentenced him to crucifixion. And I think that in this verse, Paul is basically saying to the church in Corinth, hey, don't allow the politicians in your town to discourage you from your relationship with Christ. And I love that message. I think it's very applicable today. We are not going to get saved by politicians. Some politicians are going to do good things. Some politicians are going to do bad things. Some politicians are going to do good and bad things. And that's okay. Paul is saying our salvation does not depend on the politicians in our community or our state or our country or this part of the globe. Our faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is supreme over the politicians. And I think that that is a flag that Paul is waving in this chapter. And I love the fact that it's so apl applicable to our situation today. Then in verse 16, Therefore let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. So these are religious holidays, cultural holidays. Uh, what kind of food do you eat? What kind of drink do you drink? Maybe, maybe that has to do with social class. Uh, certain classes drink... Uh, certain drinks that are cheaper than other classes and the wealthy elite people drink uh, drinks that uh, poor people can't afford. And I think that all of this cultural issue is part of what Paul is talking about to the Colossians. He's saying, hey, don't be disappointed if you're, if you're drinking the cheap drink. Don't be disappointed if your food isn't the same as the other people's food. He says, this is not gonna make a difference in your life. Look at what Jesus is doing and understand how important that is. The new moons or the Sabbath. And so in this little paragraph, Paul is kind of sweeping a whole bunch of things up in this pile. The Sabbath is a reference to the Jewish law. The new moon is a, is a reference to the calendar. And in Rome during the first century, they were changing the calendar uh, away from a lunar calendar to a, to a solar calendar. And so there were some arguments and some politics and a whole bunch of discussion about the right way to do things. And Paul is just taking all of these controversies and lumping it in to these quick little sets. <clears throat> these are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism, which is a form of self-denial and worship of angels which is kind of a, a, a worldly spirituality uh, or a spirituality that has to do with intermediary beings. One of the things the Greek philosophers taught people was that God didn't create the world because he couldn't create a material world because it was evil. And so he would use these intermediary spiritual beings, angels, to create the world. And so that in the Greek philosophy, different parts of our world and our experience were controlled by angels or spirits and if we would worship those angels or spirits we would be more powerful more popular more sexy you know the the roman and the greek pantheons included gods and goddesses that represented these values and people would worship those gods and goddesses because they needed something people would worship the goddess venus because they wanted a husband they would worship the goddess Asclepion because they needed to be healed from something. They would worship Hercules because they wanted to be powerful. And uh, Hercules is my hero, you know. And so those heroes of the Greek pantheons and the Roman pantheons became things that people used to focus their goals and their objectives in life. And Paul is kind of saying, hey, as Christians, we don't need that, you know. We don't need to worry about the heroes that motivate us to be more powerful or to work harder, or to go to the gym or do whatever. We don't need to be worshiping the, the, the rock stars that uh, fill our lives with idea about power and glory and, and social success. We need to be focused on what Jesus is doing in our life. 
And so I love the way Paul works these things together. Then, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind and not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. So here Paul is contrasting the different religious expressions with the church and how the church is drawn together and connected to each other because of their connection to Christ. Verse 20, if, Christ, if with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, and so again, this term, elemental spirits of the world, a kind of a worldly spirituality. He's saying if, if you are in Christ and you've died to worldly spirituality, why is if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Referring to things that all perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion, and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. And so here in this ending of chapter 2, Paul refers those Christians in Colossae to the story we read about in Acts, where God took Peter and he had a, a dream or a vision, and God basically told Peter, hey, don't worry about kosher. Don't worry about the, the clean foods and the dirty foods. From now on, because you're in Christ, everything you eat is clean. And so now today in America, we still continue to have versions of religious food control. <laughs> it's like, oh my goodness. We have kosher hot dogs at the supermarket that we can buy if we want kosher. And actually, I like kosher hot dogs because they're all beef and they're not mixed with other things. And, you know, I sometimes will have kosher, not because it's not because I'm Jewish, but just because I think they taste better. Then there's people in my life that, that won't eat certain kinds of animals, won't eat any animals, won't, won't eat anything but vegetables. We have a lot of food rules in our world. We have a, rules about what kind of bread we can eat and what kind of flour we can use. <laughs> I'm just like, oh my goodness, what in the world? And I think some of these things are important. If you have celiac disease, you need to avoid gluten. You need to do the things that you need to do medically in order to be successful and in order to be healthy. But when we base these, when we base the decisions of our life on things that aren't related to health, aren't related to science, aren't related to, to wisdom, then what are we doing? Are we following a movement or are we wanting to be part of a social group just because we feel like that's gonna make our life better? And Paul is kind of saying, hey, don't get caught up in that stuff. You know Christ is your savior, be part of the church. The church is the group that you should be connected to. The church is the group that you should be loyal to. The church is the group that you should find direction in. And that's the way Paul is, is moving this passage forward. Now, this chapter is, a, is, a, is an awkward chapter because it's full of philosophy, it's full of ideas, it's full of theology, and yet it's hard to apply in our daily lives. But let me warn you, next week in chapter 3, Paul is going to give us the very specific list of all the things that shouldn't be part of our life. And oh my goodness, when we get there, we're gonna be glad that we understand where Paul is coming from. Because he's not giving us a religion, he's giving us wisdom, wisdom that's based on the teaching of Christ. Wisdom that's, that's connected to who Jesus is and, who, and what Jesus reveals to us about God the Father. And so this chapter is important, even though it's not very specific and it may be difficult to apply, it is foundational to the next two chapters, which are going to deal with how we live our lives in our families and how we live our lives in our communities. And so for the next couple of weeks, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about godly living in our homes and godly living in our communities. 